Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. Most in-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. By ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by Casper an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchased by visiting casper.com slash hamnation and enter promo code hamnation. This is Ham Nation, episode 305 for June 21st, 2017. Prepping for Field Day. Hi, welcome to another episode of Ham Nation. I'm George W5JDX with you tonight. Bob Heil is out. He had some uh, last minute things come up that prevented him from being on the show tonight. He really wanted to get back into the preamplifier project for the pine board there. But uh, next week. Uh, Tonight, we've got a special show lined up for you. We're going to be talking all about Phil Day, and we've got some folks here to help with that. Uh, Let me introduce the first one here. It's it's our friend Val, who's probably going to get more contacts than any of the rest of us this weekend. Oh, I don't know about that. It's going to be a brutal weekend for Phil Day. It looks like a lot of the country is either going to be in a... Huge heat wave, or the rest is going to be uh, getting rained on. But uh, uh, definitely looking forward to field day this weekend and making as many contacts as I can. Won't be using my call. But um, uh, in addition to today being the longest day of the year, something else happened on this day. Um, You know, Jerry and I are from Crescent City, Illinois. And back on this day in 1970, Crescent City actually blew up. It has nothing to do with ham radio, but they say if it bleeds, it leads. So go ahead and roll the (laughs) tape, Brian. Um, It was like a 108-car train that derailed, and it was carrying 10 tankers of liquid propane. And uh, one of the tankers went like 1,600 feet in the air. Another one went through two houses, a cement garage, and embedded into a house. Uh, a third house, and uh, thankfully, nobody was killed. We had about 60-plus injuries, uh, mostly firemen, and one girl who was delivering newspapers that morning. But, um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. We lost 90% of the downtown business district and a lot of houses. And uh, um, so that's a little history on little bitty Crescent City, Illinois. So, wow. Uh, it's pretty wild. Uh, every five years, we have a big fireball. It's a big party with bands and stuff to celebrate uh, surviving the big explosion of 1970. So uh, just thought I'd show you guys that for a little fun. Wow, that, that, that would have been... Uh, I thought it was, <laughs> was a nuclear <laughs> holocaust when I... It looked the, like it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah and it, it lasted, that fire lasted 56 hours because the, oh, as wow. one would finish, one more would blow up and then another one. And finally they, you know, had to, and they couldn't get near it because it might explode. So, uh, yeah. or blevy, you know, so yeah, it was pretty crazy. So, Wow. Also with us tonight is our good friend, Don Wilbanks, who I don't know what he's going to be talking about, but I guarantee you it'll be interesting. I'm going to be talking about, well, Amateur Radio Newsline, and we're going to have uh, Dr. Tamitha Scove on, and I'm going to be rooting for LSU as they're uh, ahead of Florida State, 5-2 right now in the bottom of the seventh in the College World Series. Go Tigers. And uh, we'll probably be talking a little bit about field day as well. Not sure what we'll be doing because, of course, we're kind of uh, caught up in Tropical Storm Cindy, or at least the outskirts of it. We're getting the rain part. Nothing bad, just a rain event. But uh, will probably prevent me from going outside much for field day unless it really clears up. But uh, we'll do something, even if it's wrong, George. You know that. And it probably will be. 
It probably will be. I'll agree. <laughs> well, Don, we'll be back with you in a little bit. But right now, the host with the most, Gordo. Hi there, George, and hi to all the Ham Nation viewers. All is well in Southern California. And as Valerie said, field day, get out the bug spray. Back to you, George. Okay. Well, I know you've got some short shots for us tonight. Are they... Are they anything to do with field day? <laughs> a whole bunch to deal with field day. Brian, go ahead and start them, and we'll do the CW for the next shot. Here we go with field day. And we encourage all of you for field day to post your field day banner so we can attract more folks and to That was did odd it, our great hobby. And uh, in laying out field day, uh, many times those of you with uh, drone capabilities can get a good shot of the proposed area. And then once you have the proposed area shot, then you can go ahead and zoom in and do it on paper. And here we see a field day layout where all of the stations are peppered all around this large rectangular area, everybody doing their own thing, somewhat separated from one another. Well, this may be good when you're putting up antennas or looking at where you're going to put all the stuff. Always remember, safety, safety, safety. Watch out for those two top wires. They are uncovered and they are thousands of volts. Not to be mixed with field day. Well, here we are out on the West Coast and uh, we've got a little tropical stuff coming up from the South. Nothing like what you've got, John. But uh, we're beginning our field day setup. And we decided instead of peppering ourselves all around, we would much rather put everybody in a group. And kids are an important part of field day. Here's K-6 Wilson High School kids getting ready to tune up and turn on. And uh, our field day activity through uh, my work with the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary was there. And they'll be on the air at many field day locations. Down at the beach, you've got your own field day, and that battery setup is working with the bio-inno lithium iron phosphate battery inside that uh, field day radio cabinet, and it'll go for two and a half days, no problem. And here's the MTARA, Emergency Communication Service team members, up in the uh, area where they have the huge fire in Big Bear. And they're going to be standing by for any emergency comms during their field day, starting day after tomorrow. They've got a good setup there. So we choose to put all of our operators in close, and we put the antennas far away to minimize interference. Most important, though, if we're going to get more new hams in the field day, we got to make sure that they know where the spot is with good signage. Here we see all the operators together. Yet the antennas are far away so that we don't have interference. And think about brush clearance. Make sure that uh, all of your generators and so on are not going to either ignite the brush or put out uh, lethal fumes. Make sure that generator is uh, downwind from the field day operation and that you're all safe from any fires that could occur. And what we found out at Field Day a couple of years ago was after we got through with Field Day, the optical shaft encoder in one of our other HF radios was sort of intermittent, and a good blowing out with a uh, big uh, air compressor made the trick. This is what's inside your big tuning knob that an LED sights through to get the clicks to turn to the next frequency. Um, field Day operation. Yep, CW, very important. That's why we're doing CW here, to encourage all of you to learn a little bit of CW. Make sure your field day radios are not LED, but rather LCD, so you can see them in the bright sunlight. Uh, the uh, the old-fashioned uh, red uh, LED uh, field day radio is a little tough to read, so make sure that you've got a radio that is easy to read. Here's that little Ellicraft that is always a favorite. We're going to be using the ICOM IC9100. There you see it there. And that rig just works and works. It's done everything from field day to quartz fest and keeps on going. How are you going to do your logging? Many new field day operators are just learning about operating field day. They don't have the computer uh, uh, training to do uh, computer logging. So paper logging is okay. 
and your headsets. Well, Bob Heil will want you to use a Heil headset. But remember, if you have the headset plugged all the way in, those that are looking over your shoulder are not going to hear squat. So beside the headset, leave it halfway plugged in so there's audio for folks looking over your shoulder wondering what you're doing can be heard loud and clear. So headsets, absolutely, but make sure that there's running receive audio so those uh, listening in uh, from a couple feet away can uh, begin to hear the excitement that's going on. Here's the uh, BHI DSP noise canceling speaker. This is a great speaker and did well at field day despite all of the RF around. And again, there's nothing wrong with paper logging. It's just that at the end of field day, someone has got to read that paper log and see if we can decode it. And those headsets are great for HF where you can hear your own audio coming back in the monitor mode. But on VHF and UHF without the monitor mode, it's tough to talk without being able to hear what you're saying because of the great uh, noise cancellation of the headset. So you may want to just do a one ear headset. You have someone that wants to play radio and do other things. A good position is uh, having fun as the safety officer. Here's Joy, K6JOI, ready to go out looking for hazards to keep all of us safe during field day. And, of course, you got to have an antenna analyzer, and there's a couple of them there once you have your antennas up in the air. Brian, we're going to go nice and fast now. So the SWR analyzer, you bet. That's absolutely necessary. Field strength meter, that lets you know you're on the air. And before you get out there, make sure that you've got all of your antenna elements marked. And remember, at field day, if the sun's out, and it will be, uh, these things get red hot. So do your antenna set up early in the morning. Have everything well documented on the antenna elements themselves. Wind yourself your own ballon, uh, and that will uh, tend to, I should actually say, wind yourself your own choke, and that'll keep the RF from uh, coming back down the coax. And make sure that everyone is safe around your field day station. There we are going to be on six meters, big time uh, with uh, the big six-meter antenna. And if you don't have a huge antenna, even mobile antennas, put horizontal for two meters and the 440 band work well. Here's six meters, two meters, 220, 440. They are ready for field day. And of course, extra points for satellite. Be sure and check out the American Radio Relay League guide for field day operations and how to make extra points. And those satellites will be whizzing overhead. And we've got so many. You can easily pick up a couple hundred points. Now, for 160 meters, you could consider buying uh, a little helium and getting a helium balloon way up in the air that you see there. Make sure it's not windy. Make sure there's no power lines within a mile before you set that balloon off and break out the wallet because that big H tank of helium is going to cost probably more than 100 bucks, maybe even more than that. Anderson connectors, yeah, they're great, but check them out. Andersons, many times, if they've uh, been schmoozed too many times, they either fracture the plastic or, in this particular case, the black Anderson just pulled right out of the printed circuit board. Uh, yeah, a little uh, technology error there. Here's a common one. My radio's not working. No problem. Uh, the little pin that locks in the upper, the red one, uh, fell out, and uh, hopefully it didn't fall into anything that will be uh, conductive. But uh, you need to have those Andersons perfectly aligned. And uh, here's the ham source uh, Anderson. So you can get a lot of great Andersons from DX Engineering, but put a rush on it because field day is day after tomorrow. Solar panels, the BioInno folks have probably the best bargain on solar panels. Here's a fold out one does about five to six amps. And of course, food, you got to have food at field day. That's going to attract all of those hams that normally don't turn out the field day because all hams like to have a little bit of uh, food <clears throat> and have fun. Here's Gary, our ATV man. And uh, he and I are zooming around uh, getting ready for a fabulous field day. So field day is here starting this Friday late afternoon or evening for your setup or Saturday morning early setup. And we hope all of you have a wonderful field day. We hope the weather is great. 
you enjoy some great sunsets. And best of all, be safe and have some great camaraderie with your fellow ham radio operators because you'll discover that they can pull off some magic at field day with things that need to be done that only they can have the skills to do, and you'll have a great field day. So, Don, we're hoping that you don't get drenched on field day, and we look forward to hearing all that happened down south. Here's Don. See everybody on the air for field day. Well, I think what I'm probably going to end up doing is loading up an umbrella and seeing just what frequency I can get on an umbrella. Uh, <laughs> it, may be the, it may be the way we do it, but of course, yeah, field day. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about DX engineering. You need to get you one of these catalogs right here if you don't have it, because everything you need for field day is right in here. And uh, especially last minute field day gear. And yeah, field day is coming up this weekend. And you say, well, there's no way I can get anything out of this catalog for field day. Oh, contraire, mes amis, because most orders on in-stock items placed before 10 p.m. Eastern time will ship the same day. So if you get that you order in today tonight before 10 o'clock and if it's in stock chances are it'll ship same day and for even faster delivery you can get next day and second day air shipping so no excuse if you need it dx engineering has it and uh, they can get it to you remember there's uh, more to field day than just radios and antennas here's some bits of gear you might have overlooked in planning uh, for your field day station and setup dx engineering has a whole wad of folding chairs canopies and umbrellas to keep you comfortable all day long Regardless, if uh, Mother Nature is uh, shining or raining on you, you can get official ARRL and DX Engineering apparel like polo shirts, T-shirts, and hats. Also, DX Engineering has the pre-made coaxial cable assemblies that you need available in common lengths with popular cable and connector configurations. And yes, you can roll your own custom tailored to your application by using the custom cable builder at DXEngineering.com. Gordo mentioned the Heil Sound lightweight and versatile headsets in his uh, segment. They let you stay comfortable for hours and hours of outdoor operating. They feature microphone elements that deliver excellent on-the-air clarity that Bob Heil is known for, and the Heil headsets are padded for comfort. They're built to survive in harsh operating environments as well. Bringing multiple radios to field day? Well, check out the HF multiplexers from Low Band Systems. Uh, use the multiplexers to connect multiple radios to a single multiband antenna so you can use each radio to operate on a different band simultaneously. This reduces equipment installation hassles, mitigates the need for extra antennas and coax cables, and of course the less wire you have to put up in the air, or the less aluminum you got to put up in the air, uh, the less chance you have of it accidentally contacting uh, an electric wire, and uh, nobody needs or wants that, so it could be a safety thing. Not just convenience. For Field Day, it's tough to beat the performance, versatility, and portability of wire antennas. Field Day or any time, actually, they're my favorite uh, configuration. And DX Engineering's wire antenna kits have everything you need to build virtually any wire antenna type. Several kits available. Visit DXEngineering.com to find the one perfect for your station. And you know, DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. Most orders placed by 10 p.m. Eastern Time are shipped the same day. With proven products and expert advice, DX Engineering helps you shrink the globe. So request your catalog or shop online 24-7, 365 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. dxengineering.com slash hamnation. You need this catalog. If you didn't pick one up at Dayton, well, look at there. They will mail it to you just like they mailed it to me. There's the mailing label right there. They'll, uh, And in fact, if you, if you make an order, chances are you'll uh, get one of these and you'll probably get some Nifto, Swifto, keen little stickers in there as well. They just, and they have the best bubble wrap in the industry. I ain't kidding you. Man, I love DX Engineering. George, DX Engineering is just an amazing thing, and I know that you've ordered a lot of stuff from them too, right? I sure have, and I'm going to talk about one of those things you just mentioned here, and just a little bit. We're going to use it a little differently. Well, I think Val has some special field day stuff for us this year. You know, you want to get as many points as you can, don't you, Val? You do, and it's good. And and I want to show you guys this. We got these from DX Engineering. Um, these are individual bandpass filters, very important for field day. And uh, we even got a camp chair because we needed to add something to our bag. There you go, to get us up yep. to a hundred bucks. So we bought a camp chair too. So uh, yeah, these really work out nicely for field day. So the Perfo box. But um, yes. Um, we're, before we get into field day, I'm just going to talk about some events coming up. Um, so coming up first, 
we have, uh, not this weekend, obviously, is field day, but next weekend is all of you guys. I know you guys like to chase uh, multiple stations. We'll get ready. 13 colonies a week from this weekend. So uh, that's going to be uh, a lot of different stations you can chase. Uh, get the original 13 colonies. And that's going to be July 1st through the 6th. Uh, so you can look forward to that. Uh, next weekend, also, uh, there's a whole bunch of ham fests coming up, especially if you're in the Pennsylvania area. They're all in Pennsylvania. Swear to God, Harrisburg, uh, the Murgis Ham Fest, uh, the Somerset County Ham Fest in PA, and there's one in Indianapolis as well. And then um, also the following weekend is the uh, South Milwaukee Amateur Radio Club uh, Ham Fest. That one's near and dear to my heart. And what's really cool about that one is it's only $5 whether you're selling or buying. So everybody just pays a flat fee of $5 when you pull in. So there's a lot of people selling stuff because it's the same price as entering. And uh, they even got me this. I don't know if you can show this, Brian. They made me an honorary member of the club. I used to be a member of the club collecting the $5 every uh, 4th of July weekend. But um, uh, I'm now an official member uh, back on the rolls again of the South Milwaukee Amateur Radio Club. So thanks, Karen. Uh, also coming up, SMC Fest. Now, this one isn't coming up till August, but um, there's not a lot of hotel rooms in the block. So I just wanted to put it out there. Anybody in the Midwest who's starting to get into contesting, this is really a great event. It's all day seminars, um, all about contesting and lots of good prizes because I'm on the I'm the prize I am the prize committee for that one. And um, it's going to be in Bloomington, Illinois. So anybody in the area or close by, uh, that's really a, a great event. Also, um, W9DXCC, uh, that one's coming up in September. Um, I don't know how they're doing on hotel rooms just yet, <clears throat> but they do go pretty, you know, the block that they have uh, can go fast. So uh, that one's great because the Friday before they have a, uh, a contesting and they also have a DX University. And if you pay for one or the other, you can swap between the two. You can, you know, like this class on DX in the DX and then the next class you can take it on contesting. So you can switch between the two things and it's all day classes, all day Friday and then Saturday, some really great presentations on DX and DXing and solar cycle and all that kind of fun stuff. And of course, uh, a great banquet and again, lot of really good prizes because again i am on the prize committee on that one too um also sedco is coming up and that's w4 dxcc and that's september 22nd through the 23rd now that hotel is not very big it's in, it's in severeville severeville which is right a suburb of uh pigeon forge beautiful location great place to bring the xyl to uh there'll be a lot of events for her to partake in a lot of antiquing and crafts and really a great town uh, to hang out in and um, that hotel goes pretty yeah I know I don't know why we made the front page we're not even from Foreland but we go to that uh, pr pretty much every other year but um, it's a really a great event and that'll be a all about DXing and contesting uh, Friday and Saturday and that hotel does fill up pretty fast although there's a campground right across the street and all kinds of stuff so I'm glad you guys know this now so you can get a room also, uh, last but not least, uh, the International DX Convention. Now, the hotels just went on sale uh, two days ago, and I set my alarm to go off on my phone right at noon central, and uh, I got a room, and I think within an hour or so, the rooms at the, ho at the Marriott were already sold out. But there are three other hotels nearby, so if you're thinking about going to Visalia, I would highly recommend you get a room now, even though it's not till next April, uh, because it's such a great event. Lots of people from all over the world come to that, and uh, so it's worth it just to get a hotel, just in case they're not gonna charge you till you get close anyway, probably, so uh, probably worth it. Um, and that's all I've got for events coming up uh, not a lot of dx so um but uh because it's summer but that'll be coming soon but now i want to focus on field day so rather than poor brian doing all these slides i put it all together on video so you want to go ahead and show that brian so tonight i'm going to focus on field day bonus points now there's actually 17 
different ways you can earn loads of bonus points and uh, these do add up so tonight I'm going to focus specifically on these uh, media publicity getting elected officials there agency officials social media and your public information table so let's start with elected officials now that's anybody that's elected that you voted for uh, your congressmen and your senators although they may be tough to get at your field day site so start with your state rep your mayor sheriff council members county commissioners school board uh, superintendents anybody you voted for judges they all count so um, make sure you go after them also uh, your agency reps you get 100 points for that so American Red Cross Salvation Army Emergency Management Law Enforcement now the ARRL does give you a sample letter that you can send out to all these agencies to try to get them to show up so uh, try and personalize it a little bit but uh, go after that and, and there's 200 easy points next thing we're going to talk about is media publicity now this one's pretty easy you don't have to get it in the newspaper TV or radio although I'm gonna try and help you make sure you get it in there you get a hundred points just for trying now they're gonna give you a sample uh, press release to send to the newspaper TV and radio um, I would use this for the newspaper but when it comes to TV and radio I would definitely alter it um, TV everything has to be there 15 seconds 30 seconds or a minute that's just how they're formatted so you might just want to type something up that fits into one of those time frames and they may be a little difficult to get uh, so I would suggest going after your local cable channel they're always looking for local community to get events so I would suggest putting together a slide maybe show a photo from last year's field day and over the top of that include uh, the location uh, and the time of your field day event now when it comes to radio those need to be either 30 or 60 seconds long to fit into their format so rather than use that press release that they give you I just went ahead and took information from that and made my own commercial and submitted it to our local radio station they're always looking uh, to broadcast about community events and they are free usually so you just submit it to the station and nine out of ten times they'll just throw it on the air for you and here's what my commercial sounded like uh, that's playing now on uh, a local radio station since 1933 ham radio operators across North America have established temporary ham radio stations in public locations during field day to showcase the science and skill of amateur radio this weekend thousands of people from thousands of locations will participate they'll be in your local parks campgrounds shopping malls and churches the ARRL field day event is open to the public in fact you're encouraged to come and check it out for more information about field day visit ARRL.org slash what is ham radio or better yet show up to one of these locations in and then of course name all the locations now another way to get an easy 100 points is to have a public information table you advertise you're gonna get all these people showing up so now you want to give them some information when they do uh, included in your field day packet is an ARRL uh, flyer all about amateur radio uh, for those that are interested now make sure you also create a flyer about your club and in, be sure to include the date and place of your next meeting and also you need to have a place where visitors can sign in so make sure you have that and and designate one person to be the uh, spokesman for your club for when visitors do arrive and to give them a tour and all that good stuff and here's what the flyer looks like that they include in your field day packet so make sure you make lots of copies of this because you're gonna get lots of visitors right and last but not least you can get a hundred points for social media now that does not count as putting your field day information on your already existing club website you have to either create a Facebook page or group uh, go create a Twitter account or an Instagram account um, this is the way you're gonna reach the young people that every club is desperately trying to get uh, another thing you can consider streaming some of your field day event on Periscope uh, Facebook live or YouTube live so if you put some effort into going after your field day bonus points you could actually earn over 2,000 bonus points and that's equal to about 2,000 phone contacts if you're using high power or a thousand on low power and on field day that's a lot and it is a lot I mean I don't know how many hours it would take to get a thousand contacts during field day during a normal contest uh, it would take probably Jerry and I 
three or four hours at least to get that. So uh, definitely worth it to do some of those things for your field day bonus points. So uh, that's all I've got. So I'm going to head it back over to you, George. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Val. I couldn't imagine getting a thousand points in three or four hours uh, with help even, but <laughs> you guys are, are really good at that. Well, we'll be back in just a moment because we've got a lot more to go yet. And Amanda's got some uh, special field day stuff coming up shortly, too. Right now, though, let's get a message from ICOM and pay some of the bills. Calling all stations. Make sure you grab your ICOM gear for the most popular on-air event, Field Day, June 24th and 25th. Let ICOM help you make the most contacts or practice for emergency situations. Don't forget to bring along the perfect field day companion, the IC7300. Ideal for the ham on the go, it's a high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, SD memory card slot, and more. Hear and see a wide variety of signals with the R8600, ICOM's new high-performance software-defined receiver. An industry first for desktop wideband receivers, the R8600 provides a high-resolution, real-time spectrum scope with a waterfall, 4.3-inch high-resolution color display with touchscreen features, SD card slot for receive log, decode log, and voice recording, and it scans up to 100 channels per second in memory scan mode. The ICOM America Hamster Japan sweepstakes is underway. Enter today for a chance to win an ICOM radio or even an unforgettable experience to attend the 2017 Tokyo Ham Fair. Make sure you come back and enter each week to be eligible for each radio drawing and visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on this and all the icom radios and you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of ham nation go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation learn how you can win the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio and win some great prizes like t-shirts and hats as well uh, you go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation Register there after each episode of Ham Nation. We've got, uh, well, a uh, radio for June here. It's the ICOM IC718HF transceiver. Superior basic performance, DSP noise reduction, DSP automatic notch filter, and very simple operation. So go to icomamerica.com slash Ham Nation. That's where you'll find the contest page to register. And there are also... Uh, celebrating the upcoming Tokyo Ham Fair with a contest called Hams to Japan. You can register for that each week, too, and be eligible to win a trip to the Tokyo Ham Fair. How cool would that be? ICOMAmerica.com slash Ham Nation. Thanks, ICOM, for your support here on Ham Nation. We really appreciate it. Well, uh, tonight's segment, We've got, well, first we've got a video from Randy. It's not field day related, but it's about the Raspberry Pi. CPAC hosted an all-day Raspberry Pi workshop. This is aimed at ham radio operators who are interested in learning more about the Raspberry Pi, Linux, and ham radio applications operating on the Raspberry Pi. This was attended by over 100 people, and as part of their registration, each person received an SD memory card with the operating system and ham radio applications preloaded. Available for pre-order were various Raspberry Pi kits, including up through a 7-inch touchscreen LCD display. There were many presentations about the Raspberry Pi and ham radio applications, starting off with an overview, presentations in the morning, followed by presentations about APRS, Direwolf, Xaster, FL Digi, WSJTX, PackLink, and RMS Gateway. There was a lot of hands-on in the room. Everybody had their pies running in front of them, following along with the presentations and getting their software going. Some people even brought radio systems that they had interfaced for experimenting. I believe everybody had a good time and learned a lot during the day. If you'd like a copy of the presentations, you may download them from the CPAC website. Thank you, CPAC, for hosting this workshop. And thank you, Randy, for bringing us that video. Uh, CPAC's a great ham fest, 
And I bet that uh, Raspberry Pi forum was was really good. You know, uh, Raspberry Pis are becoming real popular with us hams now. I've got a few myself. Um, boy, just a, a great little computer there for not much money and perfect for experimenting. Well, tonight I wanted to talk some about field day, and I knew I wanted to do that, but uh, I've <laughs> I've been kind of busy the past week and just really hadn't had time to pull together a segment for it. So after the show got started tonight, I reached into my box of stuff I had packed up for field day and pulled out a few items here I wanted to talk about. You know, we, uh, myself and my friend Tommy in 5 zno and a couple of friends of ours, uh, Wayne and Vince Eubanks, always go out and do field day out in the woods. We'll clear out a spot, set up tents, operate from from out in the wild using generators. Uh, it's always a great time. It's usually miserably hot. Some years it rains, but this year, well, we got a tropical storm. You know, Don mentioned earlier that the rain event to a tropical storm or a hurricane is usually to the east. Well, guess where we happen to be? And guess what the timing is on the tropical storm getting up near where we are? Yeah, we got like 80% chance of thunderstorms on Friday and Saturday, and I think it's 60% on Sunday. So we had to regroup. We're not going to be able to go out and, and pitch our tents and do it out in the field this year. Uh, that's that's just the way we like to do it. That's not the only way to do it. So we had to come up with a backup plan, and we've got one uh, we put together last night. You know, on our planning, we always, uh, well, the first year we did it, we set up a wiki on the Internet, and each of our uh, group members there would go to that wiki and fill it out, type in what they would be bringing to field day, and then we could all look there and see who was bringing what so we would have a good idea of, uh, you know, that we had everything. Well, we were doing that uh, the last few years with a Google Doc. You know, you can share Google Docs, and so we just set up one for field day every year. Uh, actually, we set up one for field day the first year, and we just reshare it every year. Just go down, check off who's bringing what, and then we know when you get to the bottom of it, we've got what we need. Well, we've done that this year, but, uh, you know, the weather's changing our plans. So I did want to talk about a few of the things. So, like I said, I had my boxes packed up here, ready to go. So I just dug through them and got a few things here. The first one I want to mention, and Val is the one who uh, first turned me on to this logging package you know, in the past, we have used the Squirrel logging software to do field day, and it works just fine. Works great. Uh, very simple for a one uh, operator event. But if you've got multiple operators, it's really not meant to be networked. We have done it in the past and uh, through file sharing, and it's worked. However, it's very easy to overwrite a band and lose a lot of contacts. And that happened last year. So this year we're going with something different. We're going with the N1MM blogging package. Uh, Val, thanks for telling us about that. It looks very good, and the networking is a uh, no-brainer. It just works. So no, nothing special we had to do there for that. So we're, we're looking forward to using that this year. Uh, you mentioned a little earlier... Uh, you were talking about the bandpass filters. We bought uh, four of those. We've got them for uh, 80 meters, 40 meters, 20 meters, and 15 meters. In the past, you know, we've been out in the woods on like a 50-acre plot, so we could move our antennas around some. And we've had, you know, a little bit of splatter from band to band on particular years. Uh, and we thought we would buy some of these and uh, use them, and that would solve the problem. Well, we haven't tried them yet. You know, these are really made to be used with a multiplexer. You put one for each radio, run them through here, and then the output of all of these run into a multiplexer unit. Well, we're not doing a multiplexer on a single antenna. We're just going to use a bandpass filter uh, on each station. Whoever wants to operate a particular band will just grab that filter and go with it. And that's 
probably going to end up being good this year because our field day operating location is going to be my shack right here. We, um, we couldn't really come up with anything else that was going to be suitable to operate during a tropical storm. So we're just going to do it from here. We like to operate four alpha though. So we're going to try to stay as uh, true to that as we can. So we'll be running generators during the day on, on up to about uh, 10 o'clock at night, and then we'll move over to batteries. So all our gear is going to be powered off emergency power like we typically do. And, you know, in field day, if you're going to operate that category, you can't use any of your existing antennas or anything that's been set up way in advance like that. So I'm not using any of my antennas or anything with my normal shack. Uh, I've taken my mobile out, the IC7000 here. That's what I'm going to use for a rig. I've got my antennas, and I'm going to use... Uh, the same thing I did last year, the MFJ 43-foot telescoping pole with some bell wire to make a vertical antenna. That seemed to work pretty good last year, so I'm going to use that this year. I've also got an MFJ uh, cobweb antenna. Haven't used it before. We're going to try it this year. It'll work uh, 20 meters and on up. So that's that's another one. Uh, Tommy's going to bring his big ear. Uh, that's another MFJ antenna. And Wayne and Vince, I think, are going to bring uh, an Outbacker and a little Tar Heel, too. And they're going to use these outpost mounts, you know, like tripods you can put a mobile antenna on. And so that's basically our antennas. We're not going to be able to string up uh, a dipole uh, in the trees for 80 meters because, you know, it's going to be a tropical storm and just... Uh, really, I don't have a good place to do that because my backyard already has my other wire antennas that I can't really use for this event. So uh, what this means is we're going to have four stations operating from my QTH here on a city lot. So we've got four antennas that are going to kind of be not that far apart. So hopefully these filters right here are going to do the trick and keep us from splattering all over each other. So we're hoping for the best on that. Uh, you know, a few things I really recommend that you bring on field day, uh, being an engineer, you know, I like to be prepared for whatever may come up. So you need some test equipment. And first thing you probably need is a volt ohm meter. Uh, this trusty Simpson 260 will work just fine. Or you can use a digital meter, whatever you got but you probably want an ohm meter because there's a good chance you could have a bad cable, uh, need to troubleshoot something, check the voltage on a battery or whatever. A meter is just great for that. So uh, be sure to throw your meter in your field day bag. Some other things that, um, that I like to bring, well, is some antenna analyzers. You know, you really need that if you've got access to it. If not, you're going to need SWR meters. The most popular uh, antenna analyzer there is is the MFJ259C, and I've got one of those here. Uh, a lot of people use this one right here. My personal preference, though, is the new uh, graphing meters that allow you to see, you know, a, a spread of the band all at once so you can see exactly where it's resonant. Uh, MFJ's got a couple of those. The uh, MFJ225 is one of my favorites. I really like this one. Uh, they've also got a newer one. It's... Um, uh, MFJ226, and I think this is made by uh, Times Technology uh, for them. It is a real good uh, graphing analyzer as well. And then another one I really like is this Rig Expert A230 Zoom, or AA230 Zoom, excuse me. This one is graphing. I, I really like it too. Um, they, they make a good many models as well. Uh, so any of these would be great for uh, adjusting your antennas on field day or uh, doing a little troubleshooting. Uh, great to have an antenna analyzer. And by the way, DX Engineering, I think, covers or carries every one that I just mentioned and more. So, you know, you could possibly get it uh, if it's in stock before field day gets here. One other item, and this is kind of oddball, uh, but if you've got one, Bring it. You know, I, I usually bring this myself. This is a mega ohm meter, or otherwise referred to as a mega. There are uh, various types of, of these around. 
what they are is insulation breakdown testers. We've shown it here before on Ham Nation and how to use it and what it does. This will find faults in a cable where the insulation breaks down uh, or you've possibly got a bad connection that you can't find with your own meter. Not the little uh, continuity tests and such like that. This thing will read up into the mega ohms. It puts a high voltage down your cable, and so it'll cause it to break down if there's a problem out there. And I always bring this fill day because my friends all bring all the coax jumpers that they've got, and we'll just hook them up and run through them. And, you know, we we found cables they thought were good before that actually uh, had some breakdown in them and, um, you know, replaced the connectors on those, squared them right up. So there you go. There's a, a few of my field day tips and what my backup plan is this year. And we're we're going to go for it and see how we come out. Uh, we're going to be as as much operating wise as we've been in the past, uh, as far as emergency power and antennas that we set up right there on spot. But we're going to do it from the shack here, so we won't have to run the air conditioning off of the generators this year which it's hard to air condition a tent but we've done it okay i got some uh oh one other thing i want to mention before i i go to the prizes here we just put out uh, in the last couple of weeks our uh, amateurlogic.tv coverage of this year's hamvention we got some great interviews but th i want to point out one in particular that we had you know, our friend Jerry Ellsworth is a new ham. Uh, she and a friend were at Hamvention this year in Dayton. Uh, Tommy and I ran into them, had a good visit, did a, a real good interview there, and we found out what uh, Jerry's favorite part of amateur radio is. And you, you might be surprised, so go check that out, amateurlogic.tv, if you get a chance. Okay, you know, last week we talked about Bob's preamp board. And I showed this schematic here. And this is the basic version. If you can see that, I don't know what the, how the camera's picking that up. But, th you know, this does not have the EQ in it. This is a simplified version of the preamp that he's building. I asked a question in there, you know, we... We talked about these capacitors here on the output. It goes out to the output jack there. That's a 0.047 microfarad capacitor. I ask, what would happen if that capacitor right there shorted out? And we got some answers. Uh, but the one that wins is going to be Ken Ariza W9, or excuse me, WA9 ZQS. And he said, the capacitor you referred to is a blocking capacitor used to prevent the high voltage DC on the tube plate from passing through the output uh, while still allowing the AC signals to pass. And he says that uh, if it shorts out, the high voltage will appear on the output, and it would. The, the high voltage DC would go right through it, and it could damage uh, the next device that's plugged in there. It could also uh, knock your socks off if you got across it, too. So uh, thanks for that answer there, Ken. You're going to be receiving this uh, MFJ148RC 24-hour dual clock. It displays both your, uh, your local time as well as UTC time. It's um, radio control, so it synchronizes itself with WWV. It's got a built-in 10-minute ID timer on it. A great clock for operating. Um, thanks, MFJ, for giving us that. And we've got another question that's going to come from the Book of Gordo, the extra edition. Uh, Gordo flagged a question in here for me that he thought you might be interested in. And, you know, these are extra questions, so, you know, maybe a little bit harder. Uh, what do the letters FEC mean as they relate to digital operation? FEC, Foxtrot Echo Charlie. Is it forward error correction, first error correction, 
fatal error correction or final error correction. What does FEC mean uh, in digital operation? If you think you know the answer to that, send your net answer to me, hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you might win a copy of one of Gordo's books, your choice of technician through extra. He's got them all covered. A great study guide. Uh, I highly recommend it uh, everywhere. I think that has got it for me tonight. And Don, what ha you've got, uh, well, you were going to talk about the news a little bit. I am. But first, I want to talk about that MFJ uh, dual uh, dual clock. One thing yeah. that, that, that is not in the manual that I, f I found really interesting was I got one of those and I stayed up one night and I watched it. And at midnight local time, the two displays turned around, took 10 paces away from each other, turned around and shot at each other. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. And while you wow. ponder that, let's check out the news from Amateur Radio Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 2068, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, June 21st, 2017. Hams were recently called in to assist as flames swept through a coastal resort community in South Africa. In South Africa's Southern Cape area, the region exploded with fierce wildfires, prompting the activation of area radio amateurs to assist with communications after landlines and cell phones were disabled along with internet services. On the 8th of June, hams reported to the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network, Mosul Bay Mesh Networking working around the clock on the emergency network, as well as HF, VHF and UHF. Strong winds from a storm kicked the flames yet higher, sweeping through an estimated 20 suburbs. Hams remained engaged until June 11, when conventional means of communications returned. Especially hard hit was the coastal resort community of Naisnu, where more than 10,000 were evacuated as humanitarian support was summoned. Homes were also destroyed in nearby Plettenberg Bay. The bush wildfires came as the region was struggling with a severe drought. It was unclear what had ignited the fires. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Graham Kemp, VK4BB. No matter which hemisphere of our big blue earth you call home, emergency response is a huge part of being a ham. One community in Texas decided to help give that life-saving effort greater communication access. In Texas, the Gun Barrel City Fire Department is celebrating its newest piece of life-saving equipment, a hex beam antenna and a rotor, giving the firefighting QTH access to the HF bands. The antenna was installed with the help of the Cedar Creek Amateur Radio Club, and the new HF station uses the club's call sign K5CCL. The club station's new hex beam has access to 20 through 10 meters with a long wire for the lower bands. The fire department has had basic radio service on site as part of its emergency operations center, but adding a ham radio club station provides what Cedar Creek Club President Ed Bush, K8MKN, calls, quote, another layer of protection for our area residents. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Paul Brown, WD9GCO. It's goodbye to dits and dahs for amateurs in Jamaica as the island's regulators give a nod to modern technology. Jamaica has joined the ranks of many nations that have done away with the requirements of Morse code for amateur radio licenses. The Regulations Committee of Parliament was told that Morse code was no longer relied upon as it once was for emergency transmissions, especially with the development of more modern modes of communication. The argument was made to the committee by Ida Gay Warburton, Director of Legal Affairs for Jamaica's Spectrum Management Authority. She said the Jamaica Amateur Radio Association could expect to see a boost in membership as a result of these changes and that there were hopes this would also result in greater support for the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management, especially with the start of 2017's Atlantic hurricane season underway. The Jamaica Radio Group has a memorandum of understanding with the Office of Disaster Preparedness and the government to respond in times of crisis. The Jamaica Amateur Radio Group's president, Nigel Hoyow, 6 Yankee 5 Hotel November, told the Jamaica Observer newspaper that although older amateurs did use Morse code, he found that younger hams lacked the patience to learn. He said, quote, Morse code is not dead, but we need to get rid of it here. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jeremy Boot, G4NJH. The Jamaica Spectrum Management Authority recently granted a secondary allocation on 60 meters to hams in Jamaica, operating with a maximum power of 25 watts EIRP. 
For the rest of this week's Amateur Radio News, please listen to the full Amateur Radio Newsline report online on a repeater near you or on shortwave radio station WTWW at 9930 and 5085 kilohertz. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at www.arnewsline.org. With Graham Kemp, VK4BB, Paul Brown, WD9GCO, Jeremy Boot, G4NJH, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wellbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now here's the solar update with Dr. Tamitha Scove. We have a new region that's rotating into Earth view off of the sun's east limb, and it's already been firing a couple solar storms, so we're watching it. And we have the remnant of a coronal hole that may bring us a little bit of fast wind in through the end of the weekend. Those stories and more in the news this week. The space weather this week is calming down just a little bit compared to last week when we had that brief solar storm that brought gorgeous aurora views to Canada and up in Tasmania, even though it didn't last very long. But this week, the story is region 2664 that's rotating into the Earth view off of the sun's east limb. It's a new region, so it's kind of unstable. It's been firing off some solar storms. It's not yet an M-flare producer, but we are watching it. Meanwhile, we have this filament that it seems reasonably stable, but it's now rotated into the Earth strike zone and we're watching it to see whether or not it's going to launch as a solar storm. On top of that we have this coronal hole that's kind of a remnant coronal hole. You've got a good uh, well-formed region up here in the north that's nice and dark but this wispier region down here this is the area that would bring us some fast wind when it rotates into the Earth strike zone uh, about the end of the week. So it could give us maybe just a little bit of sporadic fast wind which for you amateur radio operators might interfere with field day. Switching to our M-Flare threat meter, you can see the X-ray flux is still incredibly low, which means the solar flux overall is really low. You amateur radio operators are still having problems with propagation, I know. We are popping a little few B-class flares here and there, but we haven't even reached the seafloor. The nice thing is that there's no chance for an M-Flare radio blackout anytime soon, and this trend will continue into the foreseeable future. Switching to your solar storm conditions, you can see back on the 16th, we did get that solar storm from some fast wind, but it really wasn't sustained. It hit storm levels twice, just enough to give us a boost in Canada. They had some gorgeous views, even down into the upper tier of the United States. And then again, we got another boost just in time for Tasmania to get a beautiful view. But outside of that, it petered off pretty quickly. That meant we didn't get any views in Europe uh, or, or even in northern UK at all. And then uh, since then, things have kind of just quieted down and quieted down and it should continue this trend uh, over the next few days at least. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we aren't anticipating much this week. We do have a chance of a little bit of fast wind that'll be kind of sporadic that might hit us over the weekend. So at high latitudes, NOAA's expecting uh, active conditions with about a 20% chance of minor storm. At mid latitudes, we're really only expecting unsettled conditions with only about a 20% chance of active conditions. That's probably over Friday, Saturday, maybe even into Sunday, but it's really hard to tell because we're not anticipating anything to be too strong. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, we are watching that new region 2664 rotating onto the east limb of the sun, and it is firing off some solar storms, but we don't expect it to be an M-flare player anytime soon. So everything is still in the green when it comes to flares. Now regarding that solar flux, it looks like we're going to be hanging on to marginal levels for you amateur radio operators. This is good news. Region 2664 is helping keep that solar flux up. So look Looks like things are a go for field day when I'm sure all of you will be loving that. Now regarding uh, solar radiation, we're not anticipating anything there either. So both you amateur radio operators and you GPS operators, it looks like it's going to be a pretty good week. So the space weather this week looks to be calming down compared to last week. We don't have any strong storms on the horizon. So you aurora photographers, unless you're at high latitudes, you can probably put your cameras down and take a nice little breather. When you amateur radio operators, it also doesn't look like there's all that much on the sun's agenda this week. So you might have a very nice field day weekend. And you GPS operators, everything also is in the clear. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Dr. T. Appreciate the update for solar weather for field day. You know, there's one thing that you're going to need for field day or actually after field day. And it's the one thing that you cannot find 
in the DX Engineering catalog. They have everything you need for field day except for the one thing you need for after field day, and that is a comfortable mattress. That's why we want to tell you about Casper. Casper is an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost. Casper is revolutionizing the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms and passing the savings directly on to you, the consumer. And Casper is obsessively engineered mattress at a fair price. They're made of supportive memory foam for a sleep service with just the right sink, just the right bounce. Plus, it's breathable design, sleeps cool, helps you regulate your temperature all through the night. And the Casper mattress gives you long-lasting comfort and support. And you can easily buy it online and completely risk-free. Leo Laporte uh, has a Casper mattress and uh, loves it, just absolutely loves it. Casper understands the importance of truly trying out the mattress that in all reality you spend a third of your life on. Literally, you do. Eight hours a night, spend a third of your life on a, on a mattress. Casper offers free delivery and painless returns with a 100-day tryout period. So you don't have to lie down in a showroom. And you know, statistically, lying on a bed in a showroom, it's completely worthless. It has no correlation on whether the bed is right for you. Casper mattresses hold up to the highest environmental production standards, and they are made in the USA. Free shipping and returns to the USA and to Canada as well. Go to casper.com slash ham nation. You can save an additional $50 towards a mattress purchase by going to casper.com slash ham nation. Enter the promo code ham nation. That's casper.com slash ham nation with promo code ham nation. Terms and conditions apply. Go check it out because after field day, you're going to want to get a good night's sleep. Amanda, I got invited to do something kind of cool. I know you're into DMR and a lot of other folks are. We have the DMR after show net and everything. Well, next Thursday, not tomorrow night. But next Thursday, I'm going to be on Talk Group 3105 for their 8 p.m. net uh, via my little uh, my little MD380 here. So uh, thanks to Denny for Lucky. inviting me uh, inviting me to uh, to do that. It's the Arkansas Group uh, Talk Group 3105, 8 p.m. next Thursday night. They're going to have a little net, uh, and uh, they've invited me to be on there. So uh, if you're around a DMR radio and you got Brandmeister, uh, by all means, uh, check it out. And of course, check out I the After Show Net on TAC 311 tonight. I'm going to check in while you're gabbing here, probably. All right. Well, I don't have, we don't have a capability of Brandmeister right now, but we will shortly. Sorry, I didn't mean to wave that in front of the camera there. Echolink. Everyone. You can get in, you can get in via Echolink too, and I'll, I'll figure out exactly how and let you know how, but you can do it via Echolink. You just go to, go, go, cool. look up t uh, Talk Group 3105. They got a Facebook page, they got a website, they got everything. And I realize I'm pointing my thing at you, and I know that that's probably <laughs> uncouth, but. Nonetheless, that's just the kind of guy I am. So I will point on. back. I carry will point on. back. <laughs> oh, take that. Oh, now we're Ooh. having a duel. Split screen us. Come on. So here we go. You go that way. I'll go this way. Let's have a duel. We'll have a duel. Oh, see, now you just loused everything up. There we go. I'm oh. working on it. There we go. Uh, this awesome. is horrible. I don't know if <laughs> I can approve uh, antenna waving at each other <laughs> on the that. show. I'm glad Jeff, Jeff's not watching. Um, okay. <laughs> I got some stuff to go over. Let's go over the radiogram first. Brian has some pictures to show you. Brian, if you find the yellow one first, let's stop on that one. There you go. And my super photography there. We can maybe turn it sideways so everyone can see it right. Anyhow, you guys are all familiar with the radiograms. Um, this is what you send during field day. You're going to get 10 points for each one you send, up to 10 of them. And uh, someone can, Valerie, correct me if I'm wrong on this. Do you get an, another 100 points for sending one to your section manager? Is that correct? Yeah, 100 points. I thought if, yeah, you have to send one to, yeah, your section manager for 100 points. And then you get 10 for each one you receive out on field day, correct? Send on field day, yes. Okay, that is correct. So this is one that I sent last year. And yes, you guys, this is my handwriting. I do not have girl handwriting. I'm really sorry. Um, I sent this to Tim Duffy because we were just kind of trying to make up some that we could send real quick. And I said, hey, he's a section manager. Let's send one. Not that I got extra points for sending it to him because of that. But anyhow, let's go over it. On the top left, let's start there. We have a number. You fill in the number of the radiograms. So it would be the number um, in sequential order that you have sent. So I always started with 1,000 just because a one is just weird. So start with 1,000. This is 1,003. And I would show you the first two, but they were really, really bad. 
in handwriting, so I apologize. Now, the precedence. Now, that's kind of important. Typically, it is routine, and you don't have to put in routine. You can just put an R instead for routine. Other choices would be emergency, welfare, or um, there's actually two emergencies, but basically, most of our traffic anymore is routine. And the HX, which is blank in this one, don't leave it blank. I did it bad. Uh, there's uh, several different choices for handling instructions, which is what HX stands for. Um, your typical one would be HXE, or they would usually just put an E in there, which means uh, delivering station, get reply, reply from addressee, originate message back. That just means they acknowledge that they received the message, and there you go. Other choices are give them this message within this amount of time, and then you would fill in the time that you would want. Again, this isn't really, re that's, that's not normal for um, field day traffic. So we're just trying to help you get your messages out for field day. If you guys want to do, if you actually have real traffic, you better talk to a traffic handler and they can help you fill out one for real purposes. Um, okay, let's go move on. The station of origin, that's going to be your field day call sign. So if you're operating under your club, it's going to be your club call sign. That's it. That's how easy it is. Or you could probably use your personal one. It probably wouldn't really matter. Uh, the check, that's how many words are in the actual message. So there's 20 words. Now let's let's go over that. There's not actually 20 words. If you look at the message, you see these X's or we call it X-ray when we're delivering the message. That's just your, that's your space. That's like your period after a sentence. So those count. And that's important to make sure you get that check right. Um, next. Place of origin, Canyon City, Colorado, because that's where we were. Time filed. Guess what? Left it empty, probably because we pre-filled these out and gave them when they had a traffic net on field day. So the time did was left out, but you should definitely put in the time. Now, there's two different times. Do you want to use UTC time or do you want to use your normal military time? I guess the choice is yours. I would probably use UTC time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, of course, the date. That's pretty easy stuff. Now the two, obviously all the pertinent information. A telephone number is probably the most important part of the two besides the name of the person. Most people are not gonna go to an address to deliver this, but they will definitely be calling the person to give them this message. So again, that's pretty important to know who and where it's going to. <clears throat> Next, okay, so you see the message there, 20 words, keep it simple. Some things that they recommend is saying, you know, if you if you this was for your dad and you're overseas and um, you're trying to let him know that you made it there OK or uh, everything's fine, you arrived fine. Don't put dear dad. Don't put dear Tim. Those things are unnecessary and unnecessary wording. So other than that, down at the bottom of that, that's just um, for the people handling it to who received it. And um, they fill that in once they receive the message and when they file it and when it was delivered. So at, if you see up at the top right again, this radio message was received at, well, I have no idea when it was received because the person handling this on the other end was filling that in when they received the message. And so you have these radiograms filled out. How do you get them out to people? Well, you get on HF and you listen for your um, regional traffic nets. Uh, that's the best way to do it. So we that's what we do here in, um, I guess you would call it in zero land. They have a regional net. Now, Val, do they do the same thing up there in the Wisconsin, Illinois area? They have a regional HF traffic net to receive I, these? I believe they do. Yes, they do. Um, okay. I, I haven't had to deal with it, but I know they do because uh, that's how we do send our traffic. Okay. And um, we're fortunate on field day, um, these traffic handlers are ready for you. So they'll also be listening on some of your local repeaters. It's probably just, you have to check out in your area how it is. So anyhow, just a quick thing about radiograms there. Let's move on to some questions, shall we? Um, first one, it's going to be for you, Val, um, when I find it. Okay, yes. This one's from WB3BJU. Don, he wants to know, do we need to send a QSL card to receive one for the HN300 event? Well, if you don't have any QSL cards, you can just write the contact information, uh, information about the QSO on a sheet of paper. 
uh, and send out to any one of us. Um, so make sure you put your call sign, the date, the time in UTC, um, the band or frequency, the signal report and what mode, SSB for sideband or whatever. Um, and then make sure you put that in with a self-addressed stamped envelope. And the reason we're all asking for that, like I made over 1500 QSOs. Now, if I had to carry the take care of the postage for everybody on that, that would cost me over $750. So, you know, most of these people, they, I mean, I'm just getting ready to send, this is my, I'm sending my first batch out, okay? And you can see how many <laughs> there are here. There's a lot. And they all sent me return envelopes addressed to them. Saves a lot of time. So I can just get these out in the mail right away. Um, so that's the best way to do it. So if you don't have a QSL card, you can still uh, write us, you know, just write it on a sheet of paper um, and then just enclose a self-addressed stamped envelope for us. And uh, we'll get you a QSL card right away. Absolutely. And you, I have gotten some that have not had um, stamps on it or I did get just postcards from you guys. I'm going to be nice and I'm going to send you a card because some other people have included two or three dollars. So um, we're going to spread the wealth and everyone's going to get a card because of that. And that's been I really I didn't want to keep the two dollars, but it fell out of the envelope and I don't know who it came from. <laughs> so I had a couple right. with money in it, too, and I just sent it right back to them. You don't need to send us two dollars unless no, you're overseas don't send money. or out of the country. And even I got a Finland one. He sent three dollars, and it only cost a dollar fifteen to send it back to him. So thank you so much, Maddie. But uh, definitely way too much money. So um, all right, next question. Let's go, George. Are you, is anyone when they're participating in field day? Are they going to do fine throwing up a G five RV or any other kind of wire antenna? Is that are they going to be okay doing that in field day? Well, sure. I mean, throw up whatever you can. Uh, it, you know, we're using a couple of mobile antennas here for two of our stations. So, uh, you know, it's it's better than operating into a dummy load. Use use whatever you can. G5 RV, that, that ought to be just fine for field day and allows you to, to get a bunch of bands on a single antenna. We usually use all, at least one off-center fed dipole for the same reason you can operate um, multiple bands with a single wire antenna. But, uh, you know, uh, those are, are uh, two good um, choices there for wire antennas because you get more than one band. And, you know, you probably don't have room to put up a wire antenna for every particular band. And, Amanda, I've got a question, too, I'd, I'd like to throw out there if I could. Absolutely. Uh, because I don't know. Some people were asking in the chat room, and I have thought about this. And so I'm going to address it to Val and to you. I'll address it to Don, too, but he throws pickles on field day, so I'm not sure that. Uh, <laughs> that, that wasn't me. That you know. was somebody else, but I watched it crash. Anyway, go ahead with your question. <laughs> okay. Uh, since, uh, you know, we're not going to be going out in the, the woods and doing field day due to the tropical storm, we're going to operate from our shack. And, you know, I've got, got generators and all that for uh, all the ham gear. But I've also, you know, got the ability to do streaming video because this is a studio, too. And I'm, I'm wondering, is it kosher to stream any of the field day event? I know you're not supposed to go on the Internet and go trolling for contacts. That's, you know, that's that's not acceptable in contests and things. But uh, what about the streaming uh, on video? If maybe you didn't mention the frequency you were on. Well, what do you think about that, Val? Well, I actually asked um, Dave, is it Patton or something? Yep. Patton. Yeah. Dave Patton about this because I like to do Facebook Live. Um, and he said, go ahead and do it because you're promoting the hobby. Just don't have the frequency showing up if you can. Um, uh, but do anything you can to promote the hobby. It's a good thing. So that's what Dave Patton told me um, at the ARRL. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you're good on that. Um, and, and really field day, I mean, it's kind of a contest, but it's not like a real contest too. But uh, I, I say go for it. And Dave even said go for it for me. So I think Absolutely. Okay, cool. Have fun with it. Definitely. And um, knowing knowing the guy, what you guys are going to be doing, you're probably not going to be set up on holding a frequency. You're probably going to be tuning the dial and working other people. So I don't see right. why it would be a problem. So I think you guys will have fun. I can't wait to watch some of it if I'm not too busy. Actually, we're okay. in a place with no cell phone <laughs> service, so 
I'm not even going to have internet for like 48 hours. I'll get over it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's okay, move on. I have, I have, sorry, I have so many announcements to make and uh, some, a couple more questions. Okay, Val, one more quick question. Um, any reason to save the ADI or TQ8 files once they are uploaded to LOTW and the QSO show in the list? Okay, if the QSOs show on the list, I don't see any reason to keep your uh, TQ8 files. You can probably get rid of that. But I save my ADIF files. I even save my cards, even though the card checker sent them in and turned them in. I mean, you just never know when you'll need it. But you, I toss the TQ8 files, no problem with that, if you see them on LOTW. And then I just want to mention one other thing for field day. A lot of you may be new hams or don't belong to a club or maybe just getting back in the hobby or moved to a town and don't have a field day home. Um, go, uh, you know, my first year I was a ham, I just showed up at a field day site with a tent and I said I was new to the hobby and can I hang out? And they were <laughs> all more than welcome to let me hang out and I got to help out um, in a lot of areas and I learned a lot. Another thing is too, just go ham, uh, field, ham uh, field day hopping and go to a bunch of clubs and see their field day operation. And you can kind of get a feel for what group best fits your style if you're new to the area and new to the hobby. So uh, I wanted to mention that too. So back to you. Absolutely, that's a, that's the a key. If you guys are thinking about getting into HF, go, go to field day. This is what's gonna spark it or tell you that it's not for you. So this is gonna be a fun, fun time for, and it, field day is one of my favorite events of the whole year. I get so excited. Um, I really do love it. I love meeting all the new people and um, seeing people that come out only once a year for field day. This is our time to catch up. And it's so hard because I'm stretched both ways. I wanna be on the radio so bad and work some pileups and stuff, but I also wanna talk so much. I bet Val, you're the same way. So, okay, a um, couple more things here. Boy, there's so many ham fests in July. I don't even know what the deal is. Okay, Milwaukee Amateur Radio Club Ham Fest, uh, Saturday, July 8th. Fox River Radio League Ham Fest, Aurora, Illinois, Sunday, July 9th. And I can't even say the King Kankakee, Kankakee. Kankakee. Thank you. Thank you, Valley You would know that. Area Radio Society Ham Fest in um, Piatone. Am I saying yep. that wrong? Yes, okay. you are. Piatone, Illinois, Sunday, July 16th. KN4BQK, June, she just passed her general test on June 10th and is now uh, studying for her extra. Congratulations, June. 15-year-old Allison, KE0NSU, went from being nothing to a general this last weekend. So congratulations, ladies. I'm really happy to see so many thrilled about being in the hobby. This is really fun. And I hope to work some of you guys on a field day as well. We'll be in Fair Play, Colorado. Again, not really sure about internet service. Porta potty campers. So we're, we're just doing it crazy. Um, all right. Um, nets. I have not seen the 40 meter net. The 20 meter net is on 14 272. Don't forget. Don's probably already checking in uh, the DMR TAC 311 D star 14 Charlie and echo link do drop in. Um, so if anyone sees the 40 meter net up there, let me know. That's what I've got. Who's closing up. Is it you, George? Uh, yeah, I'm going to close the door tonight. Thanks, Amanda. Some great information there. And, uh, you know, everybody get out and try to do something for field day. You can operate from home if you want to. If you uh, if you don't have an event you can go to, you know, less points doing that. But it's good operating experience. Gives you um, a little experience under your belt and help somebody else make some field day contacts. Don, before we go tonight, anything else from down south? No, nope, that's about it. The uh, Tropical Storm Cindy is kind of a non-issue for us uh, because it's so displaced from the center of circulation. Center of circulation is actually going to be going into the Louisiana-Texas uh, border area. And of course, we're all the way on the other side by the Louisiana-Mississippi border. So uh, all the shear out in the Gulf has blown all the, the rain our way. So it's just a rain event for us, not much into the wind, but it'll be uh, supposed to be making landfall tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. So all is well down here, just a rain event, and that is just about it. And I'm getting ready to check in on uh, TAC uh, 311 and see what's going on on the DMR net. So uh, good night, everybody. George, back to you. Okay, thanks, Don. And yeah, we've had rain here for two days now, it seems like, and it's 
it's coming down pretty good right now. It's you know the outer bands of of the uh, same system there. We get it when y'all get it down there. We get it here. It's just not quite as bad. So a uh, little change in field day plans, but you know we're going to do it regardless. Uh, Val, any any final thoughts from you tonight? You know, I did forget to mention one important piece of equipment that we make sure we take to field day, and that's our bug of salt. It actually uses <laughs> table salt, and then you have a little safety and everything, and you can kill flies and mosquitoes and whatever uh, gets in your way. I uh, uh, love this thing. So that's this sucker's awesome. going with us to field day. So that's all I've got. Back to you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Val. Yeah, be careful. Don't put an eye out with that thing. Uh, well, we appreciate everyone being with us tonight. Bob should be back with us next week. Um we're looking forward to hearing how everybody came out on field day and maybe get some reports there on how that turned out. And once again, all of you get out there and try to do something for field day. There's a field day locator on the ARRL website if you're trying to find a field day in your location. So uh, go search there and, and find one. If if you're not going to operate, just go by and visit for a few minutes and encourage the others that are there operating and kind of see what it's about. 7-3, everyone. Thanks for being here. We'll see you again next week.